Support for Conversations Live comes from the members of WPSU and from the Gertrude J. Sant Endowment and the James Olay Family Endowment. Do you own a pet? Are you thinking about adding a pet to your family? There are always questions on what kind of food your pets should eat or what amount of exercise they should get. Perhaps you have questions about livestock, about owning a horse or raising cows, but don't know where to start. Tonight, join me and ask a veterinarian. We'll help you find the answers you're searching for. Hello and welcome to Conversations Live. I'm Alex Rabb. Caring for a pet and farm animals is a real commitment requiring time, patience, and tender loving care. It can sometimes be challenging to know what's best for your animal and who to turn to for those questions that you have. Well, today we have a special treat for you as we have a great panel of local veterinarians joining me to share their knowledge and most importantly, answer your questions on everything from dogs and cats to horses, cows, and goats. Let's meet them. Dr. Fred Metzger is the medical director of the Metzger Animal Hospital, a general referral and 24-hour emergency hospital in State College, Pennsylvania. He received the Distinguished Alumni Award and serves as an adjunct professor at Penn State University. Dr. Andrea Lohr is the medical director at CP Vets, an emergency and critical care facility in State College. A graduate of Cornell University of Veterinary Medicine, she also raises beef cattle with her husband in Clearfield County. Dr. Haley Springer is on the faculty in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences at Penn State as part of the Extension and Applied Research team. She's involved in agricultural outreach activities, applied research projects, and field investigations in the area of livestock, health, biosecurity, and public health. And whether you're watching us on TV, streaming us online, or listening to us on the radio, we want to hear from you. So call us now at 1-800-543-8242 or email connect at wpsu.org and we'll get to as many questions as we can during this hour. I'd like to begin first with going around the table, so let's begin with you, Dr. Metzger. Alex, thanks for having us tonight. Everybody, if you have questions, this is the only time you're going to get free answers. <laughs> so uh, ask us questions. That's why we're here. Uh, we all love pets, and let's see if we can help some people tonight. Great. Dr. Lore, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having us. We're very excited to be here. So glad that you joined us. Dr. Springer, thank you. Hi, Alex. Glad to be here, and um, looking forward to all the questions that we're going to get tonight. I am too. In fact, we got our first caller already. Oh How nice. exciting. Dale from Dubois on the air. Hello, Dale. First already. How are you? Do you have an, a question perhaps, um, I believe about a cat? Hmm. Dale, Cat's got Dale, his tongue, Alex. Dale <laughs> may be a little bit shy right now, so let's get back to the cat question maybe a little bit later, but I do have a question. It being the summer, summer months, ticks mm. and Lyme disease. Now, I know recently I, I read a few articles on how there's a resurgence and actually more issues with Lyme disease this year. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Anyone who would like to start. Well, we're, we're certainly seeing an, an uptick in the cases as summer gets going. Um, and we urge people not to, to remember that it's not just Lyme disease, yep. that there are several other tick-borne diseases yep. that can cause um, serious illness in pets. So uh, we're, we're working very hard to ensure that we're watching for those diseases and treating them as they, as they arise. And this is so important because these are, most of these diseases are zoonotic. We can get them as well. So we can get Lyme disease. But and most people are familiar with Lyme disease, but most people aren't familiar with another disease and, and we're seeing it as well as everybody else. It's called anaplasmosis. It's another bacterial infection transmitted by ticks. In fact, the same tick as the Lyme organism, which is the black-legged tick. And we're seeing this in dogs. Mm -hmm. we're, you're seeing it in people too. I mean, this is a, an organism that can infect human beings too. So we're seeing these diseases when you talk to f physicians they're seeing the diseases. So the biggest thing, you have to be vigilant on your tick prevention year round in your dogs and your cats. And we can talk about some of the products. And also, if you own a dog, you should be doing the 4D, what we call the 4DX test, which is a test for heartworm disease and actually multiple tick diseases like Borrelia, which is Lyme disease, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, and a few others. So it's a big deal in Pennsylvania. We're number one 
And in fact, one of the recent studies, <laughs> no, we're right. number one, um, <laughs> right? I just read some, uh, just the recent uh, s statistics right now are that I think it's around 5.3% of dogs are infected with the Lyme organism. That doesn't mean they're gonna get the disease, but they're positive on the test. Mm -hmm and about over 3% for anaplasma. That's a lot of dogs. That's only the yeah. dogs that are being tested. Oh, wow. it, it's a big deal. Yeah, and anaplasma also is, is a concern from a producer, a, a, a you know, livestock standpoint, because cattle get anaplasma. Yes, yes, so. and we're starting to see more of that in the state, so that's certainly a big concern. And um, on the livestock, or on the pet side, as well as the human side, um, Penn State Extension actually just put together a vector-borne diseases team, and one of our tasks is to provide supportive information maybe outside of what our veterinarians necessarily know. Um, we have uh, several entomologists on our, within our group, and they've got some great ideas on how to manage your, um, even your lawn to prevent ticks. And so we're hoping to have some new products out to have at your clinics um, that can help support our um, pet clients. Yeah, we have some excellent products. I mean, we all might use yes. different ones, but there are some fantastic new products, whether it's Brevecto or some of the other um, medications that are very safe and work very effectively on ticks. But it's something that everyone that owns a dog or cat, if they're going outside, they should talk to their veterinarian and be on a, a prevention program right now, and it should be year round. Do you find um, the skin treatment it perhaps is better than a collar uh, when doing there, that or most, what's... Mostly, there are there is one collar that we, that we find very effective now called Soresto. Um, but, but the most effective flea and tick treatment is the one that you remember to do and to do routinely on the recommended schedule. Uh, so they, they all have different schedules, but the, the most effective one is what you remember to do. There, and there are oral products, which I find to be very helpful to get people to remember. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally, and I'm not, you know, use whatever your veterinarian's comfortable with, but I, I like a, a medication called Brevecto, which is a once every three month chewable in the dog. And also there's a topical in the cat. And sometimes we'll use multiple. We'll use that one and a topical. It depends on the situation, but pet owners need to be vigilant looking for ticks and you better be watching your kids and yourself. I had a tick bite myself just about a week ago, I had no idea. I'm like, what's going on? So it's, it's such a big problem in Pennsylvania. I think that's our number one health concern right now, at least that's a preventable disease. And certainly if you have a dog, they should get the, uh, an annual Lyme vaccine, in my opinion. Um, there isn't one for cats or people, but there is one for dogs that we like quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And um, I would highly recommend people talk to their veterinarian about that as well. We have another call, uh, Keith from State College. Hello. Hello. How are you tonight? Good. Great. So Keith, uh, I have some experts here that can possibly answer your animal question. So what do you have? Yes, uh, as I stated, we have a five-year-old female cat who every five, four to six weeks goes into a lethargic state and uh, uh, very kind of, kind of comatose, but and then she comes out of it within four to six days, and then four to six weeks later, back into it. Uh, we've been recommended a prednisolone uh, oral medication, but I'm wondering if there are any further rec recommendations for this repetitive situation. Uh, we do put uh, 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 ointment on her back for ticks and, uh, and, and fleas and so forth, so I don't think she's. Uh, I don't think it's resulting from a tick bite or, or fleas. I guess the first question is whether or not she's had a full workup by your veterinarian, especially during one of these episodes. Well, we did have a full workup. So, so blood work and and things like that while she was in an episode. Yeah, uh, okay. we did a, a few months back, but it seems to just be coming back. They can't seem to come up with any kind of a cure. Hmm. And any, but, any... But the prednisolone, the prednisolone uh, seems to help okay. when she gets it. And, but I did read, is that an NSAID type no, of thing? And I it's... did read that if you give cats a NSAID uh, on an ongoing basis, on a repetitive basis, that it could affect their liver, liver negatively. 
So, so the prednisolone is actually a steroid, and it does have, it can have some pretty significant side effects, both short term and long term. Um, there are certainly occasions where we do use it long term, but that's a, it, it's a tough situation when we cannot get an, a, an actual diagnosis. I mean, one, one thing, if I might just add, it, it's interesting, we do a lot of second opinions, and, and many times when I'm talking to pet owners and they say they've done a full workup, well, it, that's not always what's happened. So when, when Dr. Laura and I are, and, and Dr. Haley are talking about a full workup, we're talking about a physical exam of history. We're when we talk about blood work, we're really talking about the same type of blood work they would do in us, which includes a complete blood count, a chemistry panel, a urinalysis. And in a, in a cat, I would be wanting to look for retroviruses like feline leukemia or FIV. And then if we're not getting answers, we would go to more advanced diagnostics, perhaps a CT or an MRI or even a cerebrospinal fluid. It, it depends on how far you want to go, or certainly a visit to a board-certified neurologist would be a good idea if they're still having problems. But it's very important to trend blood work as well and follow changes because we can see things like hypoglycemia or low blood sugar that can cause symptoms similar to this. So it's it's really a working together with your veterinarian. And I have oftentimes have people take their iPhone and make a movie, a show us the event, because yes. sometimes we won't see it. <laughs> Videos are so important. Yep. When your pet does something weird that you think may be related to a medical issue, get a video of it yep. because by the time you get to my office, it's going to be back to normal. And yep. me seeing that can sometimes can sometimes give us uh, the clue that we need to tell what's yep. going on. Yeah. Thanks, Dale, so much for calling in. Uh, we now have Keith from State College on the phone. Keith, hello. Hello, my name is Keith Ford. I called earlier. I guess I didn't get through. It's all right, you're through now. <laughs> so what is your question, sir? Okay, I have a 13 and a half year old uh, Labrador retriever named Griffin, and he's been an excellent dog. We've been together for almost 12 years now, but he's, he's having, I guess, some major age-related problems. He does this, this, this barking spasms, he almost, you know, I have to put him in the back room, in the back bathroom and turn on the fan to get him to stop and other times he um, he'll sneak off into a corner and urinate so he wears a diaper nowadays and last night he was experiencing something that almost sounded like whooping cough but it stopped and I'm just wondering are we talking about a dog that has to be put down soon or, or what, do you, what do you read your thoughts? One thing I'm a Labrador Retriever fan just so you know and I had an older lab that had some similar signs, but this is going to go back to our workup again. I mean, one thing that I, I preach over and over again, and I probably will tonight, and I'm sure you guys will jump on, I really think it's important. Obviously, every year you need to see your veterinarian, but I highly recommend you do a blood profile every year, and then you can follow trends, especially in a 13-year-old dog. be very important to do, besides a good physical exam and history, get blood work, get a urinalysis, check for tick-borne diseases, and do, do a great neurologic exam. Because one thing we'll talk about a lot that we see in older dogs is cognitive dysfunction problems where they will have brain-related aging problems and it's more of a rule out. In other words, you've ruled out other diseases and then you come down to maybe trying some of the medications we have for cognitive dysfunction, um, which this very well could be. Dogs do get neurologic disease. They do get tumors and, and other things. So it would be important to start with the basics. You can see right now we have a picture. That's a blood chemistry profile. These are the same, some of the same tests that you and I would run. We're looking at blood glucose, which is sugar, kidney function, and a lot of things on these tests. But these give us a lot of information with a complete blood count and a urinalysis. And we can rule a lot of diseases in and out. And then we can maybe hone in on, the, on this case there's an example of a blood film, things that we're looking under the microscope, just gives us so many clues, because obviously pets can't talk, mm -hmm. and the, as owners, we have to interpret. I own two dogs, I, I, I don't know what's going on with them half the time. We, as vets, we over-interpret things. Yes. So it's really a, a working relationship with our pet owner, or pet owners, and their veterinarian. You telling us what you're seeing, and then, like I said, doing the work up and following trends is so important when we're talking about a case just like Keith's talking about in his dog. Yeah. And again, like um, as Dr. Metzger was saying, with, with that coughing uh, uh, event, 
potentially having a video would help us determine because coughing can be anything from I've got a little bit of a tickle in my throat all the way up to severe heart disease. Um, so, so it does help us because there may be subtle clues in that that would tell us what is likely, more likely to be going on. No, that's so helpful uh, because the last thing you want to do is, is have to euthanize no. <laughs> yes. your dog, especially yes. if there's something that you, could be fixed. Well, and there's just so many so. things we can yeah. do now. You know, we have ultrasound and CAT scan and mm -hmm. advanced diagnostics and we have board certified neurologists and ophthalmologists. If people need to go there, we, we can do it. We yeah. can send, all yes. of us can send someone. So it depends on what you want to do. It's a great time to be in veterinary medicine and I really think you're better off being a sick dog or cat than you're a human in the United States. I really yes. do. I believe that. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> well, we have Fern from Dubois on the phone. Um, so let's check in with Fern and, and see what the question is. Hello, Fern. Uh, I'm a, hi, I'm a first time viewer, first time caller and a Penn State grad, undergraduate and graduate. Nice. Well, thank you for nice. listening, calling Excellent. in, and uh, we are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my question is regarding a cat. I have a 14-year-old, and I recently just ran across Cosequin for cats in the store. And I didn't know if that's something that is helpful, if it's used as prevention, or if you wait until symptoms emerge or if it's something that you really wouldn't even recommend. I just had not seen that before and thought since I had an opportunity to ask, I would go ahead and ask the, uh, the experts. Yeah. Anybody have any feelings about that? You're, you're more general well, practice the, than I am, um, so. It, with, with, with Cosequin, it's a joint supplement, um, and it's not gonna cause any problems. It's more for joint mobility. So if you're using it for joint mobility kind of stiffness, I, I, don't, I think that's a, a fine idea. Um, there's certainly other things that we do if you're having more more problems, um, but Cosequin is something that you can try no problem. The the other one, if I might jump in, the other thing that will come up maybe at some point would be some of the CBD. There are there are that's an emerging topic in veterinary medicine and human medicine, and um, there's some products right now that are out which are pretty much untested in veterinary medicine, but there is a study going on in cats right now with CBD oil with a company called Elevate that I think is very interesting. I don't think there's any results yet, mm -hmm. but I, I predict, because with what we're doing in dogs, that the CBD is gonna be a huge product and really change a lot of pain management of what we've been doing in veterinary medicine. So I, I think mm -hmm. Cosequin is fine to try. It's not gonna hurt anything. Um, and if your veterinarian's on board, you're not gonna hurt anything with Cosequin. Okay. Dr. Springer, Thank have you, you uh, experienced any um, joint things or uh, any supplements that would help livestock? Um, we certainly have some available on the equine side. Um, and in fact, the company that makes Cosequin makes a product designed for horses. So there certainly are options on our large animal side. Um, on the livestock side, we don't have so much supplements, but we do have, um, in fact, this year we had our first product that was actually labeled for pain, though we've been using products to control pain in livestock for a long time. Um, just in the past year or so, we finally have a label that states that it is uh, we have a drug for pain in livestock. And so we're really excited to have that. It's a super easy to apply product. Um, and a lot of our um, livestock producers are really liking it. It's actually a pain medication that we can pour on their backs and it'll be absorbed through the skin. Oh, that's and so it's a, it's a great option. So in a new advance in pain yeah, management cool. in yeah. large animal medicine. That is very cool. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you, Fern, for that question. Uh, we have Eric from Du Bois on the phone next with some questions. So I'm Hello. excited to hear. Hello, Eric. How are you? Pretty good. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thank you for calling in. What is your question, sir? Yeah, I have a, a seven-year-old Black Lab Golden Retriever mix, and he's had digestive problems ever since I got him as a puppy. And you know, when I got him, he was—he almost looked a little sick. But you know, I, I got him home, and and he—he he was really particular about the dog food he ate. You know, I got him on a food right now. I feed him Purina meaty pouches, and he—he kind of likes that, but he's not really thrilled with it. But you know, I was wondering, can dogs get either a 
a human disease like colitis or Crohn's disease? So they, they can get colitis, and, and that can be a stress-related condition like it is in humans, or it can be something chronic. Um, when we talk about digestive issues, there, there are a lot of things that we can test for that may give us a clue as to, as to the, the cause of them. Um, things like doing uh, x-rays um, and blood work, but also looking at fecal exams to ensure that there aren't parasites that are, that are present. Um, and then up to and including things like endos endoscopy, where we put a camera uh, into the stomach and the first part of the intestine to look for changes. Um, and, and also stom you know, stomach or, or intestinal biopsies to try to get a, an accurate diagnosis and ensure that, that the treatment that he receives is appropriate, maybe improve his, his digestive issues, improve both of your quality of life. And, and yeah. I, I was just going to say the other thing, when you look at a lot of the GI diets, it, it, gastrointestinal diets, one thing, and definitely you want to rule out parasites, which are a possibility, probably not so much in a seven-year-old dog if you're doing any monthly heartworm prevention, which is a good wormer anyway, but certainly trying one of the gastrointestinal diets, talking to your veterinarian, because a lot of the diets are, if you have a dog with a sensitive GI tract, that's just not, a lot of the diets that we give are, are high, fairly high in fat and other things, and there's some really good gastrointestinal diets that I would recommend talk to your veterinarian to try, and uh, that might solve your problem. Um, fairly simply. If not, then definitely the bigger works. We do a lot of specialty stuff, so you know you can do more advanced diagnostics and sometimes you even need to do an exploratory and a biopsy, but obviously you want to rule out the normal stuff. Mm -hmm. Try a diet before you're going to go through all that stuff. And would that um, kind of coincide with the whole grain-free trend that is going on? <laughs> can dogs eat grain? Can cats eat grain? Dogs were originally wild, so I know their bodies digest differently. So the, the grain-free trend is, is mostly a marketing trend. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the companies were looking for something to distinguish themselves from other dog food or, pet or cat food companies, and so the grain-free became something that they hit upon. Um, it's a plea to owners. It, and, and if you think about it, Pet dogs in the wild generally would eat um, the entrails mm -hmm. of, of a kill first, and the, those those prey animals are eating grains. Yeah. <laughs> so, Good point. have we found uh, grain effects any livestock, doctors? A lot of our livestock are herbivores, and so yeah. for many of our livestock, grain is a huge part of their diet and an important part of their diet. Which makes complete sense. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <It does. laughs> well, you never know. I read a story on a, a cat owner that made their cat vegan, and then the cat obviously was very ill, so just wanting to put that out there. That, yeah. That's good to... Yeah. I think stick to a good commercial diet. Yes. It's amazing yeah. to me what people want to do. I mean, I don't know how much time you have in your day, Alex, but like the cooking and all that, I would stick to a good brand name. Mm -hmm. Watch some of the marketing. There's some very clever marketing, like there Dr. Is. Lore said, yes. and, and talk to your veterinarian again. I think people make it much more complicated than it needs to. Yeah. Um, I think stick to a great diet with your veterinarian's consultation and you're going to be okay 99% of the time. If you need more things to do, we can find other things for you to do than <laughs> so make up diets. And, and contrary to popular belief, we do receive nutritional training as part of our veterinary training um, and we do know more than the kid at the at the yeah. pet food store. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. the conversation with your veterinarian is extremely yeah. important. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Cindy from Urbana we have on the phone. Cindy, hello. And Cindy, if you could oh. possibly turn down your radio or television just a smidge, please. But sure. let me hear your question. <laughs> yes, um, what I have a Boston Bull Terrier who is approximately 11 years old. And my vet uh, recently diagnosed her with asthma. So she was put on a prescription medication that I really wasn't thrilled with uh, some of the effects that it had on her. So I went to a pet store to see if there was maybe something more natural I could give her rather than like steroids and so forth. Um, 
all they really had was like an allergy aid type of chew that they thought would help some. So I guess in a way this is my way of getting a second opinion. Yeah. Are the <laughs> prescription drugs the only thing that really is available to help with an asthma in a dog? Or, you know, I mean, yeah. I just... I mean, it's I'm always going to go back to you have to have an accurate diagnosis, all right? If, if you don't have an accurate diagnosis, if you haven't done x-rays or maybe air, even airway sampling, there's no way you're gonna know what's the right medication. So, I mean, if it's truly asthma, which is kind of an odd disease in the dog, yes. that's kind of an odd diagnosis to me. Um, perhaps corticosteroids would be the answer, but my question is how do they arrive at that? So certainly x-rays are a start, blood work, x-rays, uh, we're going to get a lot of information from that, perhaps airway sampling, where we get a sample from the airway. That would be very important. I certainly wouldn't want to do steroids before I d would do that. And you also want to make sure, Dr. Lord made a comment earlier, which I agree with, you, you want to make sure you don't have cardiovascular disease. So a really good exam, listening to the dog, I would start with some blood work and do x-rays and then go from there. And you can certainly, if x-rays are been, being taken, I would always recommend sending them to a board-certified radiologist. Get a second opinion. Um, just because asthma is an odd diagnosis in the dog, not so much in the cat, but in the dog, that's kind of odd to me. Yep. Second opinions are always good, I guess, even yeah. if you're a human or an animal. <laughs> don't, don't hesitate to do Ask. that. Uh, you know, we are we are all human, and and. Yeah. It is, there are, you can ask 10 different people a question yeah. and, and get 13 different answers. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Well, thank you for that, uh, your answers. We have Tanya from Roaring Spring uh, next on the line. Hello, Tanya. What's Hello. your question? Yes, um, I have a question. I have a seven year old chocolate lab um, who's very spoiled. And um, <laughs> on the weekends when we go out, um, he knows we're going out. He um, gets very anxious, and when we come home, we find out that he urinated in the house. So do you have any suggestions on how to get him to stop? And Annie does it on the weekends because we huh. both work um, 8 to 5 during the week, and he holds his urine through the week fine. It just seems like on the weekends, he knows it's the weekend, and we go out, <laughs> and he's upset because we go and we don't take him. And then we come home and find a spot where he urinates, and it's always a different spot. It's not the same spot. I mean, the big, the big thing there would be to make sure you're, you know, or do you have a behavioral problem like separation anxiety, which, which would be very likely with that type of history. But I, I, I hate to be the broken record. I would want blood work, a complete urinalysis, a really good physical, make sure you're not having prostate issues in a male dog. Make sure you don't have a right, urinary I tract all, infection. Then awesome, awesome. Yeah, I mean, then, then you're going more to separation anxiety, yeah. right? Where you're leaving and he's like, right. listen, you know, I know you guys <laughs> love me. How could you go to the lake without me? So then, then you're into more of some of the behavioral modification. Um, you know, leaving, coming back real quick so he doesn't know when you're going to the to the pond or you know playing music having a movie run while you're while you're gone so he doesn't realize they're so smart when you grab your keys they're like you're leaving i'm going to do something bad <laughs> so it, it's literally you know you got to you got to think about what they're thinking about and try to break your routines up a little bit and also i always tell people talk to a good behaviorist i mean yep. mm -hmm. the certified dog trainers are certainly more knowledgeable than i am and um once you've ruled out medical, I think behavioral. Yeah, and there's some medications that we can use as yes, well. Yes, yes, and there are there are veterinary behaviorists as well. Do you recommend crating him? Because um, he's not been crated since he's been little. I mean, that might be one it, of the strategies. You know, it depends on whether the crate would cause you know causes him more anxiety or less. And you can try things like setting the crate up and feeding him in the crate. Put his favorite bed or toys in the crate so that he has an opportunity to go in and out um, without the door shutting behind him. Uh, during times when you're home and then trying it for sh very short periods of time when you just walk out the door to, to get the mail um, so that you're sure that he's not going to have a, a true episode of anxiety while, without you there. And if the lake's not far away, you know, drive him to the lake for a short period of time, take him home. You know, these are the, the kind of behavioral things you need. You're trying to counter condition the behavior. And there's medication you can talk to yes. a veterinarian. Yes, there are well some as, great medications now yeah. for, for anxiety in, in dogs. Good question. Great. Thanks, Tanya. I hope that helped. Uh, Do Dr. Springer, real quick, 
have you seen separation anxiety in, in cattle or livestock? So livestock are herd animals, um, particularly cattle and horses. And though we very rarely would see separation anxiety from a human, um, certainly if they're separated from their herd mates, we can see separation anxiety. And that's something that we really take into account when we're designing housing for our livestock species so that they have herd mates and consistent herd mates um, so that they can build those relationships and not deal with the stress of um, being separated from their herd. F funny story, Alex, we have a pet cow named Lola who lives <laughs> in, in her own stall and during the winter, all of her herd mates are inside the barn and she can see them and talk to them. Um, but in the summer when the rest of the herd goes out on pasture and she can't because of her, her limitations, uh, she does certainly have a little bit of separation anxiety. How does, how does she show the separation anxiety? Uh, a lot of calling to her friends, <laughs> kind of moving, moving through her pen trying to get to the closest point where they are. Wow. So wow. We just give her lots of extra love and scratches. Yeah, <laughs> that always helps. Yes. Uh, we have Polly from Evansburg on the phone next. Hello, Polly. What's your question? Hi, good evening. I appreciate you taking my call. My question is back to my friend's two parties. About six months ago, the parakeet leg turned black, and he removed it himself. There's no complications. The bird doesn't seem to even miss it. And then just last week, his other parakeet flight turned black. And we have not found any reason for it. Parakeets. Is there anyone that feels <laughs> comfortable with some Not dogs? me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm trying to understand the question a little bit more. So you, you had a parakeet that... What what was exactly the problem? One of his legs turned black. One of the legs okay. turned black. And okay. Now, and you said just last week, a a different parakeet. Right. Then so that, another leg turned black. Hmm. Okay. So I think one of the things to look at is is there something in the housing of the parakeets that could be wrapping around the leg and causing an issue with circulation? No, um, it wasn't the band that is on the foot. It's on well. The foot. Uh, thinking about, you know, are there any fibers, any anything in the, the housing, because that's um, that certainly would be a concern. But um, uh, that that's a pretty unusual presentation, and certainly something that that somebody could get a look at and maybe give you a better idea as to what might be going on. Uh, with two birds affected, the other thing would be something infectious that they're passing between the two of them. Well, they don't seem to be bothered by it, and they're just as happy as can be. But they, they, they adapt very try. well. <laughs> they adapt well, very well. I am no parakeet doctor. Okay? <laughs> but like the other thing, too, you'd be concerned about is nutrition. What, what are they eating? I would talk to somebody who knows about parakeets. Make sure you're not having some vitamin mineral mm -hmm. deficiency as well. Yep. Great. If you're joining us, I'm Alex Rabb, and this is Conversations Live, Ask a Veterinarian on WPSU. Joining us tonight are Dr. Fred Metzger, Director of the Metzger Animal Hospital, Dr. Andrea Lohr, Medical Director at CP Vets, and Dr. Haley Springer, a faculty member in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences at Penn State. Our toll-free number is 1-800-543-8242, and our panel is ready to take your calls. You can also send us questions by email at connect at w WPSU.org. We do have Darla from Indiana on the phone. Hello, Darla. What's Hello. your question? Hello. Hi. I have a question about our uh, Cavapoo. She's a 15-pound little dog, and she's very lively, beautiful dog, very intelligent. And everyone was telling us we should put in an electric fence that you bury underground so that she would stay in the yard. We're kind of close to a busy highway. I just don't trust her right now. We have her on a cable and she seems happy enough that way, but it would be nice to be able to let her run free. What do you think? Are they safe? I, I generally think they're safe. Um, I, I personally prefer a true fence. So I. Uh, I feel like it creates both a, a visual barrier for them, but also 
um, uh, no other animals, dogs, cats, or, or other animals can come on, you know, into her yard while she's there um, and potentially harm her. Uh, we do see a lot of dog-dog of interactions uh, that don't go well, um, and so trying more for her protection from, from other animals and other people coming in and things like that. I, I like a, a strong, sturdy fence I, I totally agree with Dr. Laura. I mean, a lot of people have underground fences. They work great. What am I doing with my own dogs? I love my dogs. I, I don't like the idea that, first of all, I don't completely trust that they couldn't bolt, but other animals can come into your yard. So it, that, that worries me a little bit. So I think they're great for some people, but if you want the utmost security, I think are true fence, if you can afford it. I mean, you know, the underground fences now are reasonable, pretty reasonably priced, and they work great for some people. It's just for me, I like a physical barrier just to keep the other people mm -hmm. out of the yard, other animals out of the yard. No, well, thank you very much. I sure. appreciate it. Thanks Absolutely. for calling. Great calls. Yeah, it makes sense. This yeah. is fun. Yeah, we're getting lots <laughs> yeah. of good, Wonderful. good questions. We have uh, Den Dar no, Denise from Tyrone. Coming up next, hello, Denise. Hi. Hi, what's your question? Thanks for calling. My question is, I have a 10-year-old gray tabby cat, and um, she is new. She doesn't socialize with anyone but me. <laughs> it's a cat for you. It's a tabby. <laughs> yeah, true on. She, everyone don't think I have a cat, but I really do. <laughs> and um, she's going through a stage now with her, her skin. It's so dry that she digs constantly at herself, causing, like, scabby, scabby spots, but yet no bleeding. Now, I've held her under a light and all to see if anything's moving on her, and I cannot detect any of that. Ha have you had her to a veterinarian, Denise? I had her to a veterinarian here about five months ago when she went through the same thing. He, he checked her out, and he was pretty convinced that she was allergic to seafood. Really? Okay. So I took her completely off of seafood. Now I have her just on poultry. Um, and she's like, right now, I can't, I guess the anxiety, I don't know whether that would have anything to do with it because she lives down in my basement where I used to live because she won't socialize and come upstairs where I am now. <laughs> oh, it's not. It, I mean, I'm just sad. What what areas of her, her body are affected by this? Um, basically, her face, her oh. ears, her her eyes. Okay. And then um, places where she can't reach. That's what, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like under her chin. Okay. Like she's scratching at herself. So, or... so I, I don't know about you, Dr. Metzger, but when I see facial problems in cats on the skin, um, I, I have been taught by my, by my dermatologist that that is more likely to be food allergies. Yep. Um, and so your vet was probably spot on with having you make a switch. Um, checking for food allergies and doing a diet trial is pretty intensive, and there are certainly some things that, that you can look for specifically in the foods. Um, when we make a diet change, we, we need about six weeks before we are certain whether or not it's working. Um, and we need to be off of everything, every ingredient that we were on before. So it's not just saying we're going to switch away from fish. It's making sure that, you know, a lot of these foods have a little bit of, of other sure, protein yes. sources in yes. them. So. Well, and I, and I would say, you know, you have your veterinarian talk to your veterinarian again or go see a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is you have to make sure you have string, stringent flea and tick control, especially flea control. And people will say, but my, you know, my cat's only indoors. But you can still have flea allergic dermatitis, which is common, especially if you have other cats that might be going outside. So food allergy is a nightmare because to prove it is not much fun, but um, certainly doing a good skin examination, make sure you don't see any flea dirt, which is the flea excrement or other type of mites that we can see in cats and dogs or it would be an important start. And then I think doing a, a good food trial. I, I don't, don't know if I would say just stay off seafood. I would probably go with one of the hypoallergenic diets that, that, are, that are made for cats that are a little bit more restrictive. But um, that would be a good start. And certainly with, the, like you mentioned, Dr. Laura, with the facial, I think a food allergy or some of the mites, you know, some yeah. of the mites. So that's a good place to start. And one thing I would say, we're all people. If you're not getting answers, talk to your veterinarian again. 
you know, you're not bothering us. And what your veterinarian, I would hope, would say, if they're not finding an answer, like go to see one of our other veterinarians or someone else. Mm -hmm. don't, don't take no for an answer. You know, if we're not getting Advocate it done, someone, someone needs to fix that because that's not yeah. fun. You shouldn't have to live with allergies. No, I agree. I had to go through that with my cat. My one cat is allergic to everything under the sun, yeah. and he has a special food, and that stinker sneaks the other's <laughs> foods, and now, and I see him barbering, and I'm like, I know what you did. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's one thing that, that I think, you know, we have some amazing veterinary diets, yeah. and, and they, are, they are very effective, not, not the least expensive foods you can feed, mm. but very effective for the things they're, they're designed to do. But every time you sneak in that little extra treat, mm -hmm. or, or let them get the other cat's food, or those things decrease the effectiveness of the, diet, the veterinary diet that you're using, and means that you you're, could be throwing money down the drain and not helping your pet. The, the last thing I'd like to say on skin, we see a lot of skin second opinions, and especially in the dog, there's some great new medications that have come out. We rarely have to use steroids anymore. That's what we used to use all the time. There's Cytopoint, which is an injection that uses the dog's own immune system, and then we have another medication called Apoquel. Just completely revolutionized dermatology. And the other thing that I find very helpful, if you're not getting an answer on skin problems, go to your veterinarian and go to someone that will do a skin biopsy where we can get a small piece of skin. It can be done under local anesthesia. It's not a big deal. We get a couple samples, send it to a dermatologist who's a pathologist and we'll look in, with skin as an expert and get some answers. Don't sit and live with that. You shouldn't have to. And I think, Dr. Metzger, you bring up a really important point that um, not only look for that second opinion, but remember that in veterinary medicine, just like in human medicine, we have specialists. Yep. Regardless of whether we're dealing with a cardiology issue or a dermatology issue, we have specialists out there and we all have the access to um, help send your pet that way yep. if you do need that, that specialist opinion. Great point. No, that, that is wonderful because a lot of people go, well, you're, you're a vet, you know everything. No. no, there's specialties within that field. And that's well, and just the, the designation, just most people don't know this, but DVM, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, is the veterinary degree. And if you went to the University of Pennsylvania, it's VMD. That's the, the general veterinary degree. Board certified veterinarians have diplomat or a D in front of their name. I'm a diplomat of the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. I'm not, I don't know any more than anybody else. I'm just saying I'm, I'm a specialist. That's how you denote a specialist. So that's, that's what you want to look for if you need a second opinion. No, that's great to know. We have Kathy from Crescent on the phone. Hello, Kathy. Hello. Hi, what's your question? Um, uh, we have recently just um, adopted a two-year-old Shih Tzu. And she recently was um, spayed right before we got her. And she is going, she'll go outside um, and we'll get her, try to get her to pee. She won't do anything. And then when she comes in the house, then she pees. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and, um, frustrating. You know, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to, you know, if, if it's because, you know, she came from another home and she's here. Is it a behavioral problem or? You know, I mean, well, I'll, I'll I go back know. to my broken record. Number one is you want to make sure it's not a medical problem. So you want to make sure, do some blood work, make sure you don't have a diabetic pet, make sure you don't have a dog with urinary tract infection or bladder stones or a bladder tumor. That would be very unlikely in a two year old dog. But we certainly see <laughs> Unfortunately, <about> yes. urinary <laughs> tract infection, stone. So you always want to look for a reason. Is there a medical reason that she's doing this? Mm -hmm. And if we've ruled that out, then you're going to go to more to the behavioral urination problems. And some dogs, if they're rescue dogs, some dogs just need retrained. They've never really been housebroken properly. So I would start with that. And I love the behavioral people that, that, are, that are out there. The certified pet dog trainers are usually, I think, more helpful than a lot of us. And they're willing to spend more time. But I think, you know, going back to crate training and doing basic house training, mm -hmm. positive reward. One thing you want to do, you always want to train using positive reinforcement. Do not use negative reinforcement. Don't spank the dog. Don't punish the dog. Dogs think in eight-second increments. That's the way they think. Um, you know, so to punish a dog when you come home and they have peed in the house is going to do nothing but make, make bigger problems. So you want to get with a good trainer, use positive reinforcement, make sure you're getting your dog out frequently and then having a huge party when they peed outside. <laughs> like this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Yes. It really is. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you need to watch the signals you're sending your dog. 
Um, sometimes we get mixed signals and the, the poor dogs just literally don't know what they're at, we're asking them to do. Rewards, find something that your dog loves. If it's you know, a piece of a dried hot dog or some, nast, some nasty other thing <laughs> that dogs like, you use that really high reward. So whenever they do what you want them to do, you took them outside, they finally peed. Even if you're out there for two hours and they finally went, you gotta give them that treat immediately. Just have a big party and tell them they're the greatest dog ever. And you, you have to repeat that. So it's a lot of training that certainly sounds more behavioral, but it should be something you should be able to fix if you're persistent. What, what I had to do with my puppy was literally attach her to myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because I would take her outside, she wouldn't pee or she'd not fully pee and then she'd come inside and run off behind the couch and pee. And so I found that until she was housebroken, if I just put that leash on my waist or, or you know, attached her to me somehow, then she couldn't run off and do it. And I had that, that cue of, hey, I really need to be taking her out very frequently. That's a great so. idea. Think about potty training a kid. You know, you're not gonna negative, re you're gonna positive reinforce, and it takes a while. It's not yeah. gonna happen right away. So, you know, the animals are not punishing you. Everybody's like, oh, he's being spiteful. No, they're not. They're dogs. They're not sitting there all day going, how can I get back <laughs> at you when you didn't go take me to work, you know? Yeah. They, they think pretty simply and, um, you know, that's what you have to remember. Positive rewards, and you gotta give that reward right away. If you wait too long, they have no idea why you just gave them a treat. No, so that's a good point. They're really smart, believe me. <laughs> Barb from Cambria. Hi, we have you on the phone now. What's your question? Hi. What's Hello? your question? Hello. <laughs> okay, uh, I have a 10-year-old dog, uh, Dash Hound, and he has a uh, severe dry eye in his left eye, and the vet gave me medication to see if it would clear it up. And um, she then when I took him back, she said that he was totally blind in it, and um, she could either remove the eye or I could just keep cleaning it. Well, now he's develop, developing uh, the same thing in the right eye. And um, she told me just to use dry eye over the counter. And I've been using Sustain Ultra in his uh, right eye. Um, is there anything I can do different or? So there, there are, dry eye is a, is a big problem in a lot of the smaller breed dogs. Um, and it actually is much more painful, I think, than we give credit for um, if you were to hold your eye open for hours and days at a time, uh, you certainly would, would feel it. There are some good medications um, that can be given for dry eye that are, that are um, Im immune suppressant drugs, but they're given right directly in the eye. Um, Cyclosporin is the most common one. Uh, and, and using the, the sustain or the, the dry eye drops is good, but not Go, not going to be fully effective and probably not going to be saving his sight. So I would urge you to talk with your veterinarian about other medications that can be used and regularly. Dry eye is a lack of tear production. People get it as well. But one thing I would be curious in, in your case is to make sure that we really do have dry eye and not something like glaucoma. We see glaucoma in dogs and that's it, uh, increased pressure in the eye. And the way it's diagnosed is we actually measure the pressure in the eye just like your eye doctor would measure. So that would be something very important that I would recommend. Have someone look at the eye, especially if you have access to a board certified veterinary ophthalmologist, of which there's not very many, but that might be something that you might wanna bring up with your veterinarian or at least have them look and make sure we have dry eye. The way we usually diagnose dry eye is we measure with these little tear strips, it's not a big deal. But um, with glaucoma is a whole different deal. And that's a disease that can certainly cause bilateral blindness or blindness in both eyes. It'd be very odd to me that you would have dry eye in one eye and now the dog's kind of going blind. It's, it's possible, but that's a little bit odd. So I, I would want to talk to your veterinarian, go back and just say, hey, you know, are we sure this is dry? Can we check the, the pressure in the eye? I'd want to make sure you don't have glaucoma. Thank you for that. Uh, we have Bill from Stoystown, and we do just have time for one or two more calls. So thank you for everyone who's calling in. And if you are in queue, do not fret. Uh, we will email you back your answers to your questions. But Bill from Stoystown, hello, you're on the line. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. What's your question? Uh, my wife and I are on the uh, board of directors at the local Humane Society here in Somerset County. And we just had a board meeting on Monday night, and we're very concerned with 
uh, flea and tick prevention for the large number of cats. We generally have uh, 40 to 50 uh, in the shelter at all times, which is almost double what we have as far as dogs. The dogs are, are given uh, flea and tick protection, but we're looking for something that would be uh, highly effective and, 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 of course, affordable in a shelter setting where there are cats, you know, new cats coming in. Uh, some of the cats are there, obviously, are being adopted, and with volunteer dog walkers and so forth, ticks can be brought into the building. So it's, it's, a, it's a concern for us for the cats. So I was just wondering what, what the best product might be or the most affordable product uh, that has uh, a good effect of this uh, might be for our cats. I mean, my, my favorite, so we're going to talk two things. One is most effective and then the other is most affordable, right, because they don't frequently go together. It, for ease of use, I really like Brevecto. So Brevecto, there's a topical. I mentioned it before in the dog. It's a chewable. But in the cat, it's a topical, and you get several months out of it. So that's really nice. It's fairly expensive. Um, other products that have been around forever, Frontline, Frontline, Frontline Plus. You know, you can get some of these generic products actually from Walmart. That's not something I would normally tell someone to do. But in a shelter situation, first of all, we work with our local shelter, Paws and Pets Come First, and there's a lot of times that your veterinarian who's helping you out might be able to work with some of the companies. That's what we do. And they, a lot of times they'll give us products at a pretty nice discount to help the shelters out. So that's where I would start. If that's not a possibility, I would look at some of the other lower cost products. Like I said, uh, Fipronel, which is frontline, there's some generic formulations. Not my number one flea and tick product, but not a bad one. You could use in a shelter situation. So those were things that I would look at. If, if you, know, you have a big fundraiser and money comes in, uh, Brevecto would be a really nice topical in the cat that would be really good against fleas and ticks. Then you have other products like Revolution, uh, that's made by Zoetis, not a bad product, really good on fleas, not so great on ticks, but it's kind of, you know, what you're looking for and what's affordable. I don't know, Andrea, do you have any comments on that? Uh, just whatever you are using, make absolutely certain that it is labeled for cats. Yeah. Uh, one of the common things that we see is when uh, the weather gets warm, the fleas start to come out, people start putting either accidentally on or on purpose the dog's flea medication on the cat. Uh, and cats can become very sick from this. Uh, so we do recommend you check that package, check yeah. it twice, make sure that it is labeled for cats. That's very important. Yep, very you know. important. Good point. Yeah. That is a very good point. We have time for one more question. Uh, Kathy from Currensville. Hello, Kathy. You're on the line. Just kidding. We're going to Chuck from Falls Creek. Hello, Chuck. How are you? And what is your question? I'm, I'm very good, and thank you for taking my call. Of course. Um, my daughter is a junior. She's going to be a junior in high school this year, and she has shown some interest in in becoming a veterinarian, and I was wondering, she has done some job shadowing up here. She went to our local animal hospital once. Do you have any opportunities to job shadow in the facilities that you work in down at State College? Yes. <laughs> That's the short wanna, answer, yes. Do you want to start? Yeah. Um, you know, we're, we're always happy to, to work with young people to let them know the realities of veterinary medicine, give them some experience uh, to see if it's truly the road that they want to go down. Um, it is a, it's a difficult road, but it is certainly very rewarding. Uh, and, and, you know, she's happy to reach out to me at CP Vets. Um, I will leave. I don't know. We have students all the time. But the only, the only I, I, I don't want to discourage her one bit. The number one thing is get in and see what we do. Yes. A lot of people don't really know what we do. We've got a great career, but it's, it's, it's a difficult career. I mean, we're dealing with life and death every day. We have moments of... This is the greatest job ever. Do we have to euthanize a pet? That's the reality of veterinary medicine. I love the profession, but get in and find out what we do. Go, you know, with us, that's fine. But I would get her in with your local vet. Get her in there. Get her working for the Humane Society. All right. Find out. Help start. That's where you help animals out because it's a long, hard road. It's so well worth it. But get, I would get in with your local veterinarian. We have students yeah. from Penn State and, and veterinary schools all the time, so I, I highly encourage people. But I would go local. Get in with your local vet. And Dr. Springer, yeah. And I also would encourage you to branch out a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up thinking that I would be a small animal veterinarian, and I have not touched a dog or a cat in practice in about five or six years. Um, and I am absolutely loving my career working with cattle um, primarily, but also other livestock species. Um, so 
talk to other veterinarians in the area, um, talk to livestock vets and mixed animal vets because there may be opportunities there as well um, to learn a new area of veterinary medicine that maybe you aren't thinking of now. And I was going to be a dairy vet. I was a dairy vet for the first two years, and now and I'm a small animal vet. So that's a great yeah, point, Haley. Yeah, I, I went to school to be a large animal vet, <laughs> and now I'm a small animal emergency vet. But we do also, um, uh, just on our farm, we do welcome students to come in and help when we're, when we're processing cattle and things like that. So great. two options. Thanks for your call. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I'm so glad that we all got together and, and that we could answer how many questions and I know there's probably so many more that people may have, so if anyone has emailed, um, I know we can take the time to answer any of those emails that you, that you gave us uh, and that you emailed us. So thank you again for everyone who called in tonight. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. As an animal lover here and a fur mama, <laughs> I learned a little bit as well, and, and so it's it's absolutely fantastic. Again, our guests tonight have been Dr. Fred Metzger, Director of Metzger Animal Hospital, Dr. Andrea Lohr, Medical Director at CP Vets, and Dr. Haley Springer, a faculty member in the Department of Veterinary and Biomedical Sciences at Penn State. From all of us here at WPSU, thank you for joining us and best wishes on caring for your animals. <laughs>